Hello everyone, Professor Zeeb here and welcome to our short lecture on memory, more specifically something called the information processing view. So basically we're going to look at a theory of memory of how it works, in other words explains what happens when we formulate a memory. So this particular model once again is called the information processing view. The easiest way to understand this one is they use the analogy that human memory works very much like a computer. So in terms of when we create a memory, the basic steps that a computer uses is very similar to how humans create memories. In other words, when we create a memory, that information is first processed. It is then coded. And then finally, it is stored where we can possibly later retrieve it. So very similar to, for example, typing a document in Word, that information would be processed, it would show up on the screen, you hit save, it goes to your hard drive. So in other words, the basic steps are essentially the same. Okay, so let's visually take a look at this model. So it looks something like this. So in other words, whenever we form a new memory, that new information is going to enter into our system through our senses. It would then go to something called the short-term memory. Short-term memory for our uh, fellow computer geeks out there is very similar to your RAM on your computer, which would be, of course, random access memory. In other words, it's referring to a temporary storage of information. That information then potentially will go to something called the long-term memory, which is kind of like the hard drive on your computer, where it is permanent and can be accessed at a later time. So we're going to take a look at some of these components in the model. And we're going to sort of compare and contrast short-term and long-term. We'll start with short-term. As the name implies, short-term memory refers to temporary storage of information. In other words, it's something that you've just experienced and you're attempting to memorize it. Long term, on the other hand, is permanent. So these are memories that, of course, can be recovered but seem to last a lifetime. So in other words, what we're saying is that short-term memory is very short-lived, where long-term memory essentially could last your entire lifetime. A very important aspect of memory is this next one, and we call it retrieval cues. And basically what this means, they are associated cues that help you remember things. So it turns out that these are very important to explaining how memory works. They are like little memory triggers, and they often draw up memories. So for example, if you've ever been listening to the radio or uh, some kind of music device, <clears throat> and you found that when you hear this song you haven't heard in a long time and it, you start remembering things surrounding when you first heard that song, that song is now a retrieval cue. In other words, it triggers those memories of what you experienced when you first heard that song. So we, we basically have discovered that memory works through these associated cues and we often use these to access information. So to me, the big point here is that when you're studying, you should be forming retrieval cues because that is your avenue to get at those memories when you're taking a test, for example. Okay, some retrieval cues are very important to how memory works. Next, we go to vulnerability to decay in terms of how resistant are they to decay. Decay being a natural process that breaks down memories. In fact, scientists have discovered a protein in the brain that seems to weaken or destroy short-term memory. So we call this process decay, where the memory naturally withers and decays, if you will, or weakens. So we're going to look at an example, a study that sort of demonstrates this. This comes from Peterson and Peterson, way back 1959 for this one. In this particular experiment, they gave the subjects a random sequence of letters and asked them to memorize them. So in other words, they were testing their short-term memory. They would test their memory after several delays. So for example, they would present the information and then wait a few seconds 
and then would test them to see if they could recall it. They noticed when they were doing this, however, is that the students, or the subjects in this case, being very clever, were rehearsing the information in between the trials. In other words, the information would be presented, they would then rehearse it and try to remember it, and then when they were tested, they did pretty good. So to prevent that from happening, which may present a form of bias, they would ask them to count backwards from a random number in between the trials to sort of distract them. The point is we're trying to ascertain, or they were trying to ascertain, how long does short-term memory actually last? So by doing so, when we look at the data here on this chart, we see the percent of recall over here on this axis on the left, and then the retention interval in seconds, in other words, how many, time, how many seconds in between the trials they used. They found that, you know, for example, if it was about three seconds after they were presented with the information, these subjects showed about an 80% recall. In other words, they recalled most of the information. However, if we go up to about 18 seconds, they found that only around 10% of the students could, re could accurately recall the letters. So it seems that if we're not enabled to rehearse information or to think about it, in other words, we're distracted, our short-term memory probably doesn't last more than 20 seconds. So basically the study shows that short-term, as the name implies, is very short-lived, where long-term memories, on the other hand, could last an entire lifetime. It's a big difference between the two. All right, so how much does it actually hold? How much information do these two components actually hold in our memory? With long-term, if you think about it, this is almost impossible to ascertain precisely. How would you even figure out how many memories someone could have? I mean, it would be very difficult and time-consuming to figure that out. However, we know it's extremely vast. So we know it's, a, it's going to be a big number. And, I mean, if you think about it, how many memories can someone have? It's going to be huge. Short-term, on the other hand, is very easy to figure out. We can present information to the subject and then test how many bits of this information they can recall. So we know it is very small compared to long-term. In other words, it's pretty limited. And we've discovered it's about 7 plus or minus 2. In other words, the average human can remember about 5 to 9 things after one viewing. This is probably why phone numbers are so perfect, because they're, you know, most of them are in that range. However, if you ever add in a weird area code you've never seen before, now we're pressing the limits of, that, of the range and it becomes more difficult for the person. So once again, in this case, we're saying that there's small bits of information. We've found it's about five to nine things. However, if they were multi-syllable words, that number would obviously be smaller. So it kind of depends on the size of the information you're trying to memorize, but if it's at its basic form, we think it's about 7 plus or minus 2. Some of our current researchers believe it may be closer to 4. However, the classic number we've always used is 7 plus or minus 2. So it kind of depends on who you ask for this one. All right, so this will conclude our short lecture on the information processing view. Please progress to the next step.